World Wide Web. If you're not caucusing or working out who you're going to vote for and you want to join us for Congress Live, we will solve all the world's problems in an hour in a special discussion be being broadcast live on the ITUC Congress website. A couple of minutes will be starting. If people want to come and join us, they're very welcome to be part of the discussion. Here they all come, in droves, because when you've been at a five-day conference, what else do you want to do at lunchtime than talk? Um, ladies and gentlemen, today's Congress Hi, Live discussion Hi, Peggy. is entitled Unions Driving the Just Transition, and we have a very special panel of leaders of our movement, um, and I'll introduce them in just a second. Um, to set up the discussion, um, global unions were successful in inserting the voice of workers into the climate change framework, the Paris Agreement in 2015. I guess the question seven years later is, what does that look like on the ground? What has that delivered? Um, as we're all feverishly checking our phones for the other great global conference going on at the moment in Egypt, um, where the claim for loss and damage um, for South Nations is being put front and centre. Is there anything that we've learned through the just transition framework that um, will also create some more clarity on how this next stage of the climate transition frameworks roll out? Um, joining me for this discussion today, um, from my left, is Peggy, who's the president of the um, LO Norway movement. Paul, who is the new General Secretary of TUC. We've got Jody, who is the Women's Officer at ITF, and Michelle, who's the President of the ACTU. So please make them all welcome for this discussion. Hey. So guys, I reckon the most important thing on a, dis a debate like this is to anchor um, our definitions and make sure we're all talking about the same thing. And I've always scratched my head to understand what people mean when they are saying the words just transition. So I'm just interested in just running what we call the barbecue exercise in Australia, which is if you were trying to explain to somebody over a sausage and a beer what just transitions was, how would you go about it? I'll start with you, Peggy. Well, to me, just transition is a word that came from the unions, and it's all about how do we make sure that uh, today's workers that will be affected by the climate change um, uh, in building the new industries, how uh, do we make sure that those people also in the future will have uh, uh, good, decent, well-paid jobs in a new, uh, green, cleaner future of work? Paul, your, um, your movement lived through what could only be described as an unjust transition when Thatcher closed the coal mines. How do you describe just transitions. Well, I, I think building on, on, on what Peggy said, I mean, I'm very clear it's about us getting to net zero, but getting to net zero in a way that creates and protects and sustains good quality uh, employment. And I mean, what's very clear from the, the work that we've done with our own members, and we, and we did a big listening exercise maybe three years ago talking to union reps in energy and energy intensive industries up and down the country about just transition, and they didn't know what just transition meant. Um, and as I say, we've got plenty of examples of unjust transition. I mean, I grew up in Merseyside uh, in, the, in the UK in the 1980s, uh, where effectively we lost a whole range of manufacturing. You mentioned coal mine, and the same could be said a part of the country with our steel industry. And that, that industrial transition wasn't managed at all. And our communities are still scarred 30 or 40 years on from that. So I think we've got responsibility for our members, not just to have the slogans around just transition, but to be setting out concretely, well, what does that mean for me? my job, my family, my community, uh, and, and crucially engaging people in that conversation. So it's something that's done with them and not to them. Thanks. Jody. there's also gender dynamics around transitions in um, the energy um, world. How do you describe it? Um, so I think it's, uh, it's an opportunity to make sure that um, nobody gets left behind um, in the move towards uh, securing you know, a sustainable uh, world for the future generations, one that we're proud uh, to leave to our children. 
Um, but it's also, I think, a time of responsibility for our movement to, um, to ensure that uh, we can um, recognise and redress some of the long-standing inequalities uh, in the world of work today. Michelle, um, we've talked about a climate war in Australia over the last decade. Um, how do you describe just transition in the context of such a contested space? Peter, what I say when I'm talking to the workers about this is that it's about having a bridge, about knowing and being able to see and touch and feel a bridge that you can walk over to the future for you, your family and your community in terms of good, quality, safe union jobs. So diversifying economies, not just promising people it'll all be okay one day, mm. there'll be a job for you, somehow you know, the market will work this out. What we know uh, is necessary for a just transition is you cannot leave it to the market. You cannot leave it to capital to alone look after working people. It's essential that workers are at the table, that it's designed in a way that responds to local communities and what's needed in those communities, and that it doesn't just think about the short term, but thinks about the long term. I, thinking about what Paul was just saying, before I was at the ACTU, I was a leader in the textile, clothing and footwear union. So I, I saw firsthand what happened when industries were abandoned um, and the workers were left with a promise, but no reality. Mm. Because what happened for the vast bulk of workers in our country in that sector is that as manufacturing declined, their skills and experience and enormous contribution to our country was not respected, not recognised, and there was assumptions made that they would just get a job in the development of new industries and sectors, and the vast bulk of them didn't. These were good, hard-working people in the prime of their working life who never worked mm. again. Mm. So I'm passionate about the fact that you can't just leave this as a loose theory. You have to do the hard work that means creating the jobs now and doing that in a way that is very much based on local communities and what's going to work and involving workers and their communities mm. in the decision. And you know, I, I love that idea of building a bridge and what the structure looks like. Um, in comparison to textile workers who would still be typically in a city where there were jobs, this transition is also geographically based as well. So how does that add to the complexity of explaining what a journey looks like when you've got an entire community that's been built around mineral extraction being told, well, you, there's no future for you? Well, I've spent a bit of time in some of our mining communities and communities where, uh, which are reliant on coal-fired power uh, jobs in Australia, and many of those communities are in um, remote and isolated parts of Australia, not in inner cities. And so even more so, you have to do the work because if you're in regional Queensland, uh, industries just do not just sort of spring up by themselves. And the other thing about workers in those communities, if you think of workers in coal-fired power and coal mining, they fought uh, proudly to make those jobs safe and union jobs. They weren't like that to begin with. They were jobs that were highly dangerous uh, and low paid and exploitative jobs. So the unions and the workers in those towns and communities know what it took to make those jobs better and safer. And they are rightly suspicious about, it's not just any job. They wanna make sure that the jobs that are being created are jobs that are similarly safe secure, well-paid and unionised. Mm. So that, it, that means that you have to design it in a way that's going to um, have requirements on both the companies that are transitioning themselves about what they do to look after people and support people to make changes, but also on new industries about requirements about the type of jobs that are being created. Yeah, Paul, that idea of designing change, that's... It's, in a way, unions have always done that. There's always been change and consultation provisions, but this is just on a much larger scale, right? Yeah, well, I mean, the TUC's been in existence for 154 years, and throughout that time, our unions have always not just coped with industrial change, 
when we've been at our best, we've shaped that industrial change and made it work for working uh, people. But I think, you know, Michelle sort of poses some big challenges there because I think we're very clear that not every green job is a good job. You know, so if I think about some of the jobs, which it might be about reforestation, it might be about retrof retrofitting homes with, with insulation, a lot of that work is fragmented, it's low paid, it's poor quality. In offshore wind, there's a real variation. There are some good quality union jobs, and we know there's also jobs, particularly in so support services, which are basically minimum wage. Real issues around things like if you compare the safety record of offshore wind with offshore oil and gas. So, so this is where I think we, we do need to be set, you know, our, our benchmark has got to be good quality employment. And, and one of the things that our government set up a couple of years ago, a Green Jobs Task Force, which unusually for our Conservative government did involve unions and employers and others. And one of the things that I think there was a consensus on is that we're not just going to measure our success by the number of jobs, we're going to measure our success by the quality of the jobs that we create. Now, unfortunately, the government thought that that was a wonderful idea and has done precisely nothing with it at all. But that's, that's our challenge is to turn this up, that consensus into real policy you know, the big political decisions that we know need to be taken. Yeah, as an outsider, it's hard to get a handle on the British gov the Tory government, because it looks so awful on so many levels, but then you look at climate and you go, it's, explain it to an outsider, what's going on there? Well, well, well British politics looks awful to somebody inside the system as well as, as outside. I, I mean, actually, there's a lot of good rhetoric, and actually some... To give the government uh, cre uh, credit, we've got very clear targets around net zero by 20 2050 uh, and so on. I think what, we, what we've certainly seen, I, I would say two things that have, have emerged in the last sort of period. One is that we've got a group of, effectively, they would never admit this, but climate change deniers in the Conservative Party. And they're the group that probably, there's a big uh, overlap with the, the Brexit group. But they, they're seeing the, the crisis that we're in at the moment, the energy crisis, uh, and the cost of living crisis is an opportunity to say to the government, drop all of that green stuff. We don't need that. What we need is more oil and gas. What we need uh, is, you know, sort of to, to get rid of all that expensive sort of stuff about the just transition and so on. More broadly, there's just a big disconnect between the government's rhetoric and commitments and what they're actually doing in terms of policy. So, you know, so you've got the Department of the Business on the one hand talking about net zero and good green jobs. If you looked at, for example, our skills policy, our policy on trade and the trade agreements that we've signed with countries all around the world, these issues, I mean, they barely mentioned, they don't get a paragraph, never mind, we place front and centre. So there's a big disconnect between the rhetorical commitments and what's actually happening on the ground. Mm. But that's true of a lot of what our government mm. has done. It's not just on climate. Mm. Peggy, um, how's Just Transitions been embraced and implemented in your country? Well, we have... Um with the government as a, as a direct result of the COP last year, where we had a declaration on... Uh, just put up. Everyone's <laughs> doing their caucusing, so we need to be a bit noisier. Noisier. No, I don't think oh, you're no, going to get feedback now. No, no, no. no. Closer. The mic closer. closer to me. I think it's better now, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, as a, a direct result of the COP last year, we had... Uh, uh, we had this declaration about the three-partite um, um, just transition councils. So that's one of the things we did. The, our government actually started that council this year, so we are uh, uh, about of shaping uh, a mandate for how to work on this uh, on a three-partite level. Um, but we have, I would say, we have a tradition in the Norwegian work-life model of how we treat changes in work life as, as um, Paul is talking about. There is one difference I think between Norway and the UK and the rest of Europe. We never had those energy transitions that you have had because we always based our industries and our, how we are warming our houses on hydropower. And hydropower is still the, still the most important energy source for our, both our industry and also our uh, heating uh, and so on. So we never really had that transition. Yeah. So we, we, we don't have the same bad experience as you had. But of course we have had different kind of transitions, industry transitions, uh, but, but also our strong welfare state where we, where we um, make sure that workers are not left behind, that there will be new possibilities, that they will have education that the government and our welfare state is actually uh, 
making platforms for people to, to get new education and to build new, uh, new uh, industries has worked quite well in Norway, I would say. And I would also say that our work-life model is maybe the most uh, important tool we've had through those, uh, through those uh, transitions. Yeah. It's interesting, between the two of you, geographically, there's the North Sea and your approaches to the resources in the North Sea couldn't be further apart. Mm -hmm. And your, your sovereign wealth fund based on um, the, the resources that are at your disposal are held up to the rest of the world as a model. Can you yep. explain to people how it works and what benefits that's delivered? Well, that sovereignty fund is the incomes from our oil and gas industry. Um, and our government took the decision quite early as we entered the oil and gas uh, age um, that this was common values that uh, should be for the, uh, for the community. So we put all our incomes from, uh, from the oil and gas industry into this fund and it's quite uh, restricted how much the government can use in each year's budgets from that fund. So uh, we have reached now an, an amount of oh, it's trillions, I don't know the number, it's on their homepage every day how much it's Gross. Yeah, I don't check my bounce so, <laughs> bank balance either these days. Yeah. Um, but, but, um, but the thing is that the, the companies that operate on the Norwegian shelf, they are quite heavily taxed. The foreign companies pay like 70% tax uh, to, to the state, and which goes into the fund. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a totally different model, I think, than what the rest of the world has uh, done with their... And it always has been. I mean, my, my dad was a, a welder on a, a North Sea oil rig, and, and he could tell you the difference between night and day between working on a Norwegian rig and working on a, a rig for, you know, operated by Atlantic Drilling, for example, that were a US company. It was just completely different. And we, we, we took all of our money from North Sea oil and gas and used it to pay for mass unemployment in the 1980s and the privatisation of our key utilities, which we're still paying the price of uh, now, very different approach uh, and one very short-sighted than short-term. It's interesting, um, Michelle, Australia had an attempt that was largely aborted to, to build a, a, a mining um, resource tax. Um, the tax mechanism is seen often to be a way of constraining the energy use, but there is also, on the Norwegian, a model of empowering citizens. Like, where do you think it can land in a resource-rich nation like Australia? Well, I, I think part of the problem with uh, what's been a decade, re well, longer, 20 years of Australia being a laggard in terms of what we needed to do to um, address the climate crisis has been the power and the influence of the large resource companies who have um, shamelessly used their very deep pockets to constrain um, and, and run fear campaigns amongst the general population about that the impact of transition uh, away from fossil fuel and to more renewable energy would, would rise, raise prices. So making people really worried about that the impact of this is you're going to pay a whole lot more for your energy and consequently grabbing public opinion about that and that causing massive political problems um, at the time when the resource tax was uh, being uh, opposed by the resource industry, it really uh, forced what was in a Labor government to back down on something that was essential in terms of us redistributing some of the massive wealth that these companies were achieving and are still achieving out of Australia's resources. This is our collective resources, uh, what they're mining here. It's not something that's owned by them, but we don't effectively get that money back and recirculating. I think one of the things that is very difficult is we have to address both these issues. And because we are in a cost of living crisis at the moment, and it's so tough for people with wages having been stagnant for a decade and now going backwards in real terms, um, and we are seeing now predictions about energy prices rising again dramatically in the coming year or two. Um, we can't not talk about this. We have to be, I think, very honest and open with people about the way of making the shift in our energy sources, but doing it in a way where we ensure that some of that massive wealth is used to assist people so that they're not bearing the brunt 
of higher prices without support. So I, I think it can be done, but it requires some pretty major uh, redesign of how we work both in terms of tax, but also uh, supporting the people that need it the most. Mm. And um, we haven't got there yet, but I, I'm, you know, with the election of a new Labor government that's made some great commitments, feels to me we have momentum now on this and it's a real opportunity for Australia to make some big changes in the coming few years that will put us back on the right path. But it's not an easy one, Peter. There's a lot of work to do. Jody, you get a bit of a helicopter view being part of the ITF. Where do you see interesting um, applications of these ideas? Um, so, Peter, I want to... Hmm, is that working? Just go a bit closer, I think, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, Peter, um, I want to centre my contribution through the lens of gender equality. Um, and there is no sustainable future without gender equality at its heart. Um, but in uh, a male-dominated uh, sector like transport, um, gender-based occupational segregation and the persistent systemic exclusion of women from decent transport work means that any change, including changes for a sustainable future, will only deliver a just transition for women workers, where there are gender impact assessments, there's gender responsive investment, uh, with the inclusion of women workers' voices and leadership at the core. Um, just transition initiatives and government policy investment in low carbon transport must address the systemic exclusion of women from decent and secure work uh, and violence at work including through the ratification and implementation of ILO uh, Convention 190. Ending the systemic um, exclusion of women is really critical in male-dominated industries like transport. Um, making visible and addressing as a construct the way that all the interrelated and mutually reinforcing barriers, gender stereotypes and forms of discrimination combine because this uh, combination into a system is frankly just plain impossible for individual women to navigate. Um, and it needs to be tackled on a structural, a political, uh, and a collective level. Uh, because green jobs and workplaces will only um, deliver equality in male-dominated industries when we address the policy and the culture around recruitment, secure work, workplaces that are designed for the default male worker, uh, commuting, training, maternity and parental rights, re-entry to the workplace, uh, and combining paid work with family responsibilities, which, let's face it, hasn't been high on the agenda of male-dominated unions due to the fact that it's really men who have uh, primary responsibility for care. And of course, gender-based violence, which is disgracefully pervasive and normalised in the transport industry. Um, so only when our movement acknowledges that a male-dominated industry is in itself a form of entrenched gender inequality can we properly hold employers and governments to account for ensuring a sustainable future is, is not progressed at the expense of women who are already marginalised and excluded from decent work. Um, so, without applying a gender lens, we could potentially celebrate um, a win for workers when in reality it's a win for men and it's a loss for women. Um, That's a broad agenda to just transition. I'm, I'm interested in other guys. Um, is, has that been part of the framework, the tripartite just transition framework you're looking at in Norway? And should it be if it's not? Well, I think it's important that politics for just transition cannot be gender blind. I don't know if you are, are aware of it, but actually in Norway we have a, a quite gender segregated work market with the women working in the public sector and the male dominated uh, private and industrial sector. So to us it is important to look at this uh, transition and the opportunities that it gives to maybe uh, try to change this, but then you will have to do, in, in, in addition to what uh, Jody is saying, you have to make sure that women can get their skills, they can get the right training, and they can get this, the, the opportunities uh, they need to get good, decent jobs in these new 
uh, new industries that we that we are aiming yeah. to to create. So so, so that, I think that's really important. Paul? Yeah, I, I, it was certainly a, a, a focus of the discussion that we had on the Green Jobs Task Force about making sure that the, the jobs that were created, for example, in renewable energy or in the nuclear industry are not just replicating the, the profile, the demographic of the workforce that we had in, in oil and gas. So that's definitely around gender. It's also black and ethnic minority workers underrepresented in those, those jobs as well. And you've got to do more than just raise awareness of potential career paths. It is about designing jobs around everybody rather than you know just replicating what we've got uh, now and I think that this goes back to that sort of point about sort of genuinely seeing this as an opportunity to think about how we create new jobs it's also about how we protect the jobs we've got I mean I'm very clear I want us to get to net zero in the UK but I also want us to have a viable steel industry a viable chemicals industry automotive industry how are we support and protecting the jobs we've got there how are we making sure that you know we're producing steel in a clean way so there are there are big issues here Peter but I think definitely thinking about and it, it's being, again, explicit and upfront that we want to genuinely sort of open up these opportunities to everybody, not just replicate what's come before. Yeah. Michelle, there's also, um, I guess, in Australia's context, issues around First Nations justice as well that fits in if we're going to broaden out this discussion, particularly when our First Nations people often have um, minerals in their land, but they're also, we know that um, Torres Strait, they're facing climate inundation much like our Pacific neighbours. So how do you roll all these things into effectively a set of guardrails that allow people to safely move to an in in energy transition? Uh, I think uh, it's critically important that we have a national approach and plan for this. This is one of the reasons why we want to see a national energy transition authority in Australia that is set up as a statutory body that has uh, responsibilities and powers that uh, assist in um, driving what needs to happen across our really large and diverse nation, but at the same time making sure it does it in a way that engages people at the ground at the local level and have a, has a place-based approach to that as well. That, if you think about it, um, making sure if when a transition happens, it's not just the jobs in the energy jobs themselves. Of course, there's so many jobs around that. You think about the change that's needed and you think about skills and training and the education that's needed. You think about the health impacts of what's going on with climate change um, and all the work that is necessary to mitigate climate change as well as the energy work that's necessary. So, you know, I'm looking out to um, the secretary of our nurses union in the crowd here. And when I talk to nurses and health workers, um, they are absolutely on the front line of this. Uh, they're on the front line of it in terms of climate change. Uh, and the impact that we know, even if we achieve our targets, even if we keep to one and a half percent warming, there is still a massive impact on people's health um, as a result of that warming. And so we have to make sure that, yes, we open up traditionally male jobs for women, but that we also make sure that all of the jobs that are around the energy industry, but also dealing with the impact of climate, are supported for what is a big change and that working people are central to the changes in what those jobs now mean. Another example is, I heard a, a story about the police union when we had floods. You've had a lot of floods in Australia recently. The police union in uh, one of the towns that was flooded, the workers who were the police live in a, a house attached to the police station. And so when the flooding happened, of course, the police station got flooded, their home got flooded, they had nowhere to live, nowhere to work, but they couldn't stop working because the community was in complete crisis. People's lives were at risk. There was this massive impact on, uh, as a result of climate change in this increasing disasters. But again, there's a lot of industrial issues and planning and work that needs to be done for workers in those range of different jobs to get it right. 
In terms of First Nations people, this is such a critical issue. In our country, um, much of the land uh, that is rich with resources and has been exploited and there's still opportunity for more um, is, the, is the land of First Nations people. And in uh, too often what's happened is there's been uh, not serious negotiation where um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have had the power and the resources uh, they need to ensure that their community firstly is genuinely consenting uh, to what's going on in terms of any exploration or mining or development on their land. But secondly, making sure that it delivers jobs for the people whose land it is. Um, and not token jobs, mm. but jobs that are long-term viable jobs that will give resources and money and power and self-determination back into those communities. There is so much more work to do on this. It's a shameful history how it's been done in Australia to date. There's very few good examples of it. And we still have large resource companies fighting First Nations people um, in terms of trying to avoid them even having a say on what should happen on their land. Mm. I guess the other um, missing party to this discussion are employers. We're talking a lot about workers. Um, the different... Um, movements you represent um, work in energy industries with very different models. Um, Australia's electricity sector and energy sector was largely privatised through the 80s and 90s as part of our great neoliberal exper experiment. Um, your um, Norway's um, still got a publicly owned energy system. I, does, does it make a difference who is in control of, the, of those means of production, do you think? And how are how are the discussions happening in your country, Peggy? Well, I think, of course, it makes a difference because when we are building new green industries, the one thing that is essential is uh, energy and electricity, of course. And, and the fact that we have a, a high public ownership also makes it easier for us to, to, uh, to work with the government on how we are going to solve uh, the mm. future industries. How are we going to... To, to build more uh, green energy in the future. So, so yes, of course, it makes a, a difference. It makes it easier for us to, to, to work through this. In our model, in our uh, Nordic or Norwegian uh, work-life model, which is highly based on a, on a tripartite cooperation, uh, no matter which government, we are lucky enough to have a Labour government now, but no matter what kind of government it is, uh, we are well organized, so the tripartite base will always uh, be there, as long as we make sure that we, uh, that we create jobs that are unionized also in the future. Mm. Paul? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we've got you know, one of the most privatized, fragmented energy systems anywhere in the world. I mean, everything from production through to transmission through to retail is done through the, the private sector, and I think it's exacerbated the pressures that we've had in terms of energy costs and and energy uh, prices. So you've got this almost polarised picture where you've got the big energy producers enjoying bumper profits, I mean, unexpected profits, never thought that, you know, they'd be delivered. I think one of our, our oil and gas sort of giant chief executives described it as almost having a cash machine at the moment. I mean, the money is just flowing. Yeah. At the same time, we've had numerous companies go bust on the retail side because the margins have been so tight. And we spent, I think, was something like three billion pounds last year bailing out failed energy providers. So we've been very clear that you need to have a proper you know, profit uh, tax on those unexpected profits for the uh, energy producers, but we've also got to rethink the way the market's structured. And so for us, it's about bringing the en energy retailers into public ownership. Uh, but we also think there's a role for the state in terms of energy production as well. And, and you know, we've been influential. The Labour Party is now committed in the UK that if it, it was in government, it's going to create a new publicly owned GB, GB Energy, it's going to be called. So trying to think about their role for the state in energy production. I think that's that's got to be uh, the way forward because our fragmented systems not only put pressure on people's bills, but it's just meant that we've underinvested, you know, in terms of thinking about what the transition is going to look like. Um, you know, governments have made promise after promise about you know reshaping the UK's energy market, and it hasn't happened. And I think, you know, that this period has really shone a light into the fact that the system is unsustainable. Yeah. Sorry, Pink. Yeah, I'd just like to add that. Of course, electricity is also part of the European market in Norway, so, so the prices are high for, yeah, yeah, for both yeah. the public and the industries. 
So, but we have quite good, or we have good uh, uh, conditions that the, we have a refund on our energy bills like they are now. Uh, so they are, yes, they are publicly owned, but, but, but yes, we still do. Uh, we still have the yeah. uh, high energy prices, which is yeah. a challenge for both the, the households and also our industry. companies yeah. and industries yeah. these days. Um, we'll go along the line, Jody, then Michelle. Um, I think we have to really seriously be thinking about what, um, what we consider measures of success and making sure that they're broad enough to, um, to capture you know, what Michelle, uh, Michelle was talking about before around decent work. Um, in transport, you know, one of the sectors um, responsible for, uh, for large amounts of um, the emissions on the planet. Um, public procurement, I think, is a real opportunity. Um, and you know, just to bring in some, uh, some words from a, a ticket seller, on the bus rapid transit system in, in Bogota and Colombia. Women workers often have the most precarious and poorly paid jobs in the transport system, uh, where they're most exposed to air pollution and have the worst healthcare coverage. Many of us want to be part of the transition and to be able to show that we have the skills and the capacity to do other jobs within the system. The transition should be about clean energies and changing the dominant patriarchal culture within our public transport system. Uh, Michelle, one of the interesting new initiatives of our Labor government is what they're calling Rewiring Australia, which is basically changing the energy network from being distributed from big coal mines to being able to di distributed power. And then the discussion goes, what sort of jobs are going to build that? I know our ETU is doing fantastic work trying to make sure they're secure, mm -hmm. real jobs. But that's kind of just transition in practice, isn't it? Um, and also publicly funded. Uh, that's right, Peter. The Rewiring Australia commitment's a really important commitment of the new government, but there's, there's a few interesting and good news stories happening in Australia at the moment. We've got an election in this state, in Victoria, next weekend, next Saturday, and the current Labor government, as part of their election commitment, has made a commitment to recreate a thing called the State Electricity Commission, which was privatised. It was the ele publicly owned electricity body privatised by a previous terrible government, you know, 20 years ago, and they have announced that they're going to recreate it and it's going to only invest in clean, renewable energy. So it will be a new entity that will be publicly owned, investing in renewable and clean energy, which is a fantastic new commitment. Um, and along with the Rewiring Australia um, commitment from the federal government, you can see the sands are shifting on this in terms of um, governments at a federal and state level working together to reshape our grid. But Australia is such a vast country and um, you cannot do this a lot. So the federal government needs that buy-in and the involvement from our states to be able to get this working so we can effectively um, power Australia in a way that is moving to renewables. It's been neglected for way too long. It's not going to happen quickly. Part of the problem with it, of course, is we've got this mixture of um, some public ownership. So Queensland, one of our largest states, um, has retained uh, public ownership of energy and just in the last few months have an has announced a Queensland Energy and Jobs Plan that has part a part of it an energy workers charter that was signed off by and negotiated by unions um, and the government and employers about what would happen for workers in the transition. Many of the things that you mentioned, Peter, in terms of what ETU and other unions have raised is in that charter. So it's like we're sort of starting from way back, mm. but it's speeding up and we've got to get the building blocks right so that, um, and, the, and the big hurdle is the privatised companies that are driven only by profit. Um, and in fact, whilst the change is happening, some of the companies that are making the most money are the ones that are still in the fossil fuel industry because the prices have gone up so dramatically because of what's happening around the world. So how you drag back some more public ownership, I reckon is key to it. Yeah, Paul? I, 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 I was just gonna come in piece because Michelle mentioned good news stories and I think it is worthwhile identifying that there are good news stories driven by trade unions actually. So, you know, for example, we've got Unite, uh, our largest private sector union working right across the automotive industry. 
being really pivotal, I think, in trying to try, uh, attract investment in electric, uh, electric vehicles, ma managing the transition in, in automotive. If I think our prospect union that represents sort of senior professionals and uh, managers in the energy industry, they managed to or agreed a deal uh, at Cotton Coal Fire Powered Station, which closed down to make sure that every worker there was retrained or redeployed into either another job in the energy sector or retraining to work elsewhere. And there are lots of good examples where our unions are sort of setting the pace. What, what we haven't got is anything from government that embeds that approach. So I, I, I'll go back to the Green Jobs Task Force, one of our recommendations was that certainly every energy intensive uh, employer should be required to produce a net zero plan, but a net zero plan they've developed in conjunction with their unions and their workforce. And all too often there is that sense from our members that they know that companies are making big strategic decisions, but they're not involved in those decisions. So, you know, I mean, a lot of this is about investments and we can talk more about investment. We think the UK government needs to invest more, but it's also about embedding the right approach uh, and, and not just leaving it to individual employers to decide whether or not they want to engage with unions on this agenda. How confounding is the power price crisis sparked largely by the, the war in Ukraine being to you having those conversations with workers? I know it's particularly biting in your country, Paul. I, I, to, to be honest with you, I, I mean, I think the real issue that we've got is that the, the, the package of support from the government for, for those industries that are reliant on you know, heavy uh, energy users, the package of support has been so piecemeal, often announced late, uh, time limited, that honestly, if you were going to invest, for example, in steel in the UK, nobody knows what the energy energy prices are going to look like in six months' time. The government won't give a commitment beyond April of next year. You're not going to put that investment in if you're thinking about, well, I don't know what the, pl the playing field is going to look like uh, uh, in six months' time. And it, it's just sharpened something that um, uh, had been you know, a problem for a number of years. If you compare the support, for example, that Germany has given its steel industry and energy intensive industries to transition compared to the support that the UK was given. I mean, it, it's, it's an order of magnitude of, of difference. And so it is about this idea that you can't leave everything to the free market. Uh, you've got to invest in order to reap some of the, sort of the benefits and the rewards. And you know, from carbon capture and storage through to hydrogen, through to new nuclear, the British government has talked a good game, but has delivered very little. Mm. Yeah, that's the same, um, same in Norway. I think the most important um, task for our government now when it comes to uh, energy prices for the, for the businesses, for the industry, is, is to make sure that they get long-term prices. And they also have a tool to do that because, as I said, yeah. most of the in energy producers are publicly owned. So by uh, twisting laws and regulation, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they are trying to, to get long-term uh, contracts now. So that's really something that they have to deliver on. Mm -hmm. uh, in just a few months, I think. So hopefully we will, uh, that will be a success. Yeah. Mm. We're getting to the end of the hour. I was interested just with what's going on in Egypt at the moment and the debate over um, loss and damage. I do note that everyone on this stage is from the Global North. We did have President Waba who had been invited, but I think he's probably got some even more pressing matters um, at the moment with the elections going on. But what do you think the tolerance for workers in your countries are for this notion of support for developing nations who are, have not been through the same stages of economic development um, and the argument there should be some form of reparation paid? Do you think that's going to confound things or is there a path through that? Through it as internationalists and unionists. Um, so for us, um, making sure that our members understand the interconnectedness of this. This is a wicked world, global mm. problem. It's not a problem that's existing in isolation in any one country. And of course, um, what it means is that if you think of Asia Pacific, our responsibility as a country for our immediate neighbours um, who are today seeing the disastrous consequences of global warming, literally, you know, in terms of Pacific Islands disappearing, their homes disappearing, um, without any proper reparation or support as to what that means in terms of trying to mitigate or stop that or find the, uh, a path through that means those communities 
and countries are sustainable, and or you see the you know ravishing effects of recent floods, etc. We have a responsibility as the one of the countries that is driven that impact around the world and, and such an acute impact on our region to make sure that we don't leave behind those countries and communities. And of course, we should be paying a fair and reasonable share of what goes into supporting them in dealing with those crises and getting through it. Mm. So uh, I think we've got a responsibility of uni as unionists to make sure that we we draw, you know, we join those dots for our members, that you can't think about it in isolation to just your town or community as important as that is because it's the story of workers in the world and um, and we are only going to find solutions to this when we work together to have global solutions that leave nobody behind it would be shameful mm. if we only looked after those countries um, that are the richest in the world that have actually driven some of the worst impacts and maybe that's why just transitions is such a useful mechanism just to frame the discussion because you can't approach something you haven't named. And if it's not even in the conversation, it's there by its deficit. Paul? But, but you, you've also got to talk about it through the language of mutual gains, haven't we? I, I, I mean, our, our members aren't stupid. They, they know that climate change doesn't stop at the English Channel. I mean, you know, <laughs> temperatures don't dip because... Yeah, so, so we've got uh, you know, that international obligation, I think, not just in terms of loss and damage, but just thinking about the terms of trade. And, and the UK government has spent the last three years four years running around signing whatever trade agreements it can wherever in the world just to prove that Brexit was a huge success and we've taken back control and actually what we've done is embedded some of the worst sort of practice in terms of you know environmental damage and so on in those those trade agreements so if you think something like the energy charter treaty where you know effectively governments can be sued by corporations if they you know set up public alternatives to some of the uh, you know sort of damage you know climate change uh, creating energy production so I, th I think there is, there is something, but this is, we've got to engage our members on this sort of stuff, mm. and it's, it's not easy. And I, and I think certainly mm. for people in leadership positions, we just can't assume that we can click our fingers and members are going to follow on behind and understand the issues. And that, that's why I think certainly our, our energy unions have put a lot of time and effort into talking to rep, reps and getting that sense of what does a just transition really look mm. like to you? Well, what does it also mean to the... Now, people working in energy in other parts of the world and to communities in other parts of the world, but it's 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 not it's not easy. Um, but it's and, and, and part of telling a, a compelling story is to build signposts along the road for success, particularly as we're rolling out more renewable technology and showing the jobs that are around those. Right? Yeah, absolutely. But I think it's also about demonstrating. I mean think about this this conference the more we can get workers in different countries talking to each other about shared challenges the better and that's where we should be using the ITUC and our other international institutions mm. to get people in that mindset that you know, the stuff that matters to me and my family actually matters to people in the global south happens, happens to uh, matters to other families mm. across Europe and so on. Yeah Peggy having a union at the table in these talks is is in and of itself a stabilising force. It, it makes it more likely that a transition can take place if there are solid grounds so that people don't break and lose faith in the process, right? Absolutely, but I must say that these discussions about North, South and, and the things we've been talking about uh, here are not very much on the agenda at home in our union, so I think that's a common challenge that we have to, to put those, uh, those issues on the agenda and also that we can cooperate in the ITUC, but also bilateral yeah. in the challenges that we see ahead, but also the possibilities. So for us to, for instance, cooperate with the Americans when we see our companies uh, going to the US, you know, to, to make uh, business there, and for us to follow as unions yeah. and to have a good cooperation, I think it's essential. So, so we are working on that, but to also to raise those uh, international issues uh, at home. Yeah. Jody? I'm, I'm the odd one out in terms of um, representing an international organisation. Um, so I think that you know the spaces that, that we open up uh, on a sectoral basis really provide an opportunity for that sharing of experiences, mm -hmm. uh, that dialogue. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm going to keep coming back to um, uh, the the. Uh, the need to strengthen women's voices in those spaces. You know, we, we are a, a traditionally heavily male-dominated industry um, and our unions, you know, come from that space. We still have, you know, we're celebrating here at the ITUC um, the uh, 
the 50-50, you know, the, um, the real advancements that have been made. We've got a long way to go um, in, in male-dominated industries. Um, and so, yeah, we just have to make sure that those, that those specific um, voices and experiences of women, which are very different, um, there are, you know, some issues that go across all workers, but there are some issues, uh, and some of them are very, very basic, fundamental um, human rights issues. Um, that are, are that women in a face in addition. Um, so uh, gender-based violence is one. Um, uh, access to, to simple, um, basic human rights like sanitation facilities. Um, these things get lost uh, unless we have um, a, a critical mass of women's voices in the decision-making spaces. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's the challenge uh, that I take in our organisation mm. is to try and open those spaces to make sure that women have that seat at the table, yeah. uh, and and aren't the losers um, in this in this just transition for workers. So this has been a fascinating discussion. I think what I take out of it is that a just transition um, initially sounds like a job you dig deeper and it is about industries that are dynamic, you move beyond that and it's regions that become dynamic, nations global, but they all sit on top of each other. But at the heart of it is the idea that unions have a voice at the table, at the highest levels with the, the frameworks, at national levels with industrial laws, local democracy. So in a way, I'm, I'm just interested in a final reflection from you guys on your, your sense of optimism um, about how while this is a really difficult, scary time that we're all living through, there is a path through if we get our guardrails right. So we might just go down the table on that. You'll start well, I'm opinion. always an optimist, and I'm an optimist on, on, on when it comes to technology. So I think that uh, this, is, this is also gives us opportunities. But, but at the end of the day for the unions, I think the most important uh, uh, task is to organize. If we don't manage to organize, uh, in the new industries, then, then we won't have a voice uh, at the table. So organize, 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 always. Terrific. Paul? Well, I, I'd echo that, and I'm an optimist as well. And I think there's an opportunity for us to demonstrate the relevance of unions. Uh, when, when people are faced with these big, big industrial transitions going down the way, they need support. They need to feel that somebody's fighting their corner, that somebody's giving them voice. And I think this is an opportunity to demonstrate not just in energy and energy intensive industries, but in our public services. We know that actually getting towards net zero is gonna fundamentally change the way that we deliver some public services. It's gonna require us to deliver those services differently for people to work in different ways. Here's an opportunity for unions to demonstrate the sort of the connection between big national politics and policy and what happens in my workplace and giving people the opportunity to influence that. And I, at the end of the day, that's what we're about, isn't it? Empowering workers and giving them voice. Absolutely. Jody? Um, I think workers' stories, workers' experiences is, is really critical here um, and what this means for their families. Um, and uh, lost my train of thought. Um, I've really lost my train of thought. It's a pretty good night to finish on anyway. You round us out, Michelle. <laughs> so I, I'm going to uh, agree with what's been said, but I'm also going to say what we know is that this is the issue of the generation of young people um, who are coming into the workforce now, um, who are not highly unionised. And so if we don't get right, like these are so interconnected, these issues, aren't they? If we don't get right, our role, our job, our responsibility, to be the voice of workers around the climate crisis, um, what's necessary for an energy transition, what's necessary for justice for workers and communities in that transition, then we will be not speaking to the next, the current and the next generation of workers coming into our sectors and industries and workforces. So this is, as much as it's essential for the survival of the planet, it's also essential mm. for the survival of unions. Absolutely. Um it just reminded me of one of my favourite books of the last decade, The Wall by Lon John Lanchester, which is a dystopian vision of Britain where there is just a wall keeping everyone else out and people manning it. And the, the generation pr that, that is manning the wall can't look back at, in the eyes of the previous generation because they let them down so badly. 
these are four leaders who are not going to be people that the next generation cannot look in the eye. Could you please thank Peggy, Paul, Jody, and Michelle for their contribution today?